Change is on the way in the River City, even while some elements of local government remain the same. City Council member Jacoby Pittman leans in and lets us know what she expects with a Democrat elected to be mayor in Jacksonville. What's gone into the conversation around America's debt ceiling? And who wants change to national security? First-term Congressman Aaron Bean will give us his thoughts. Plus, honoring veterans and remembering the fallen. Wounded Warrior Project's CEO sends a message of support on This Week in Jacksonville. Thanks for being with us today. Jacoby Pittman, best known for her work with Clara White Mission in Jacksonville. She's been called an innovator in human services and anti-poverty advocacy. Since 2018, when she was appointed by the governor, she's also been serving on Jacksonville City Council. So joining us right now, Council Member Pittman, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, We Ken. got to see each other recently. I said, it's time <laughs> for us to have this conversation, and especially with uh, some of the changes that are happening here. We've just had elections in Duval County. There are new council members, a new property appraiser coming in, uh, one of your colleagues uh, yes. on City Council, and of course, voters elected a woman to be the mayor of Jacksonville for the very first time. Give us your reaction to what's happened. Here. Listen. And let me tell you, 52% of the voters said yes. And to me, that is a transformational change. We're making history. And Mayor-elect Deegan has said from the beginning, you know, love over fear, and we're going to do this in unity. And that's what she's done um, in terms of being elected. We have all embraced her. And I'm excited about what can happen in those communities that have been left behind because I have gone to events where she's been there. She's listening to the residents um, in Jacksonville and she wants to make change. And I want to be a part mm. of that transformational change. So 19 city council members all together, 14 of them in this election are going to be Republicans. That was the mm -hmm. case with the current city council, the previous council. Mm -hmm. Help folks understand how big of a, uh, how much does that matter when it comes to governing in a municipality, something like Duval County in the city of Jacksonville? Well, you know, again, we have a new mayor coming um, when legislation is developed or the voters or the residents need change in their community. They don't care if you're Republican, Democrat. They want you, one, to return their calls. They want you to come to their communities to listen to them. And I think that with the seasoned council and the new council members that have coming in, they have been on um, the journey and the trail of campaigning. So they know what their community needs. And working with the mayor and the city council members, we can get it done. So uh, I read in your city council bio, it says you served on the transition teams for mayors Delaney, Peyton, Brown, Curry. <laughs> Will you add Deegan to that list? Well, I'm not sure now that I'm on council that might not be, I may not have an opportunity to serve on the transitional team, but I am there um, for whatever support that she needs, um, whatever meetings that she needs, and really just to get an insight of what's going on in district Ten that I would be yeah. representing. You know, um, one of my colleagues called it a mega district, and that includes seven, eight, nine, and ten. So, I'm excited as a servant um, to go and work in the communities and answer the calls for the people that I'll be representing. It's interesting when people talk about campaigning, and I, I know a lot of candidates say, well, I've been out knocking on doors. Is that one of the benefits of the campaign season is getting that one-to-one -one interaction with constituents? Absolutely. Not just, you know, knocking on the doors, but at the grocery stores or, you know, in parking lots. People want you to hear them oh. and they want to know what can you do to address my issues. And, you know, for me, I've been working in the community for 35 years. So that's part of my DNA. And I want to make sure as a representative that that I'm answering your call and being um, proactive in what, what's going on in the community because, you know, you could have a pothole or you can have just some resources, you know, small businesses are need resources and some support and that's what's needed and we need to work together on the council to address and develop legislation um, to make it happen. Well, let's talk about this. You're a member of the Finance Committee for I Jacksonville am. City Council. What do you anticipate when it comes to new leadership at City Hall and this one and a half billion dollar budget that's going to be uh, it's kind of the demand is to come to city council to start looking at that by July 17th. Well, you know, I have two colleagues who have put their names in the hat 
um, for leadership, which is Councilman Ron Salem and Randy White. I have worked with them over the past four years. They've proven themselves, they're accountable, and I'm excited about the leadership and what they can do in addressing some needs in my, in my district. Yeah, do you bring specific needs like that? Hey, in my district, here's, uh, here's something that's been overlooked. How, how does that process work? Well, you know, we've had septic tanks. So over the years, you know, there have been broken promises to fix the septic tanks in the district. And we're now getting that attention. We're working with JEA um, to make sure that is happening in the community. You know, past uh, two Saturdays ago, we had a major cleanup where the city did uh, the major he heavy lifting, and I had Councilman Ron Salem and um, Randy White there with me um, so they can see what's actually going on in the community. Um, I could say I've had a very good four years working with the council. No, do we agree on everything? No, we don't, but I think I've had a lot of successes and they are listening, and I know that I can't do everything, but those things that I can do, the low-hanging fruit that I can do now and long-term and work with them in addressing their issues that they want for the districts and for Jacksonville. And us working together with, with the mayor-elect and the new members that are coming in, I think we're gonna be very successful. Councilwoman, I think a lot of people would like to hear your opinion. Duval County Schools have been going through it this last month plus, and now we know uh, Dr. Diana Green, the superintendent, is retiring three years earlier than her contract would have said that, that she would be departing. There's going to be a new interim, mm -hmm. and there's this investigation about what's happened with complaints, how they've been reported to the state, and, and what's happened at Douglas Anderson. Give us your view there. Do you think this is being handled well? How do you want to see this resolved for the school board here? Well, first of all, I have to give kudos to Dr. Green because she's worked with me on issues such as retention pond issues in the community and being located close to schools. She's a champion of education. She has proven herself to this community. Now, I am disappointed in the way that it was handled. I mean, although it is a retirement, but I really feel like she's been pushed out and a lot of the allocations I mean, allegations that have been made, some of them weren't on her watch. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, I, I, I can't support some of the things that have happened or they said that happened under her watch. It's unacceptable. And I know that she has invested um, in, in the schools here. Um, she's been able to get funding for the new schools. And, you know, she has proven her worth here. And for her to go out the way um, it, 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 it's working out, I, I can't say that I uh, approve of that. Well, we, we have reached out. I appreciate your opinions. We've reached out to Dr. Green and the school board. We're trying to get her in here to, to hear from her. But you, get, you can't take away some of those successes, including taking failing schools and turning oh, them to absolutely. better performing. You know, I, I appreciate your time. We're out of time here, yes, but I appreciate it. It just goes so fast. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I'll come back. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, stay with us. Congress has been active the past couple of weeks debating the debt ceiling, immigration policy, among other things. Freshman Congressman Aaron Dean joins us next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. Fernandina Beach lawmaker Aaron Bean is in his first term in Congress. The U.S. representative for Nassau Clay in the west side of Duval County he's joined me by Zoom earlier this week. I asked him just a few hours uh, before the announcement about Governor DeSantis joining the race for a Republican nomination for president. Love it. I love it. I think people want choice. Uh, Governor DeSantis's candidacy brings choice, will elevate the debate of the field. Uh, I think it's very exciting. I'm also excited that the next president will be from the state of Florida. You sound pretty confident on that. Uh, I think I'm pretty, uh, that's, uh, take that one to the bank. Uh, but I'm excited for him. He's, uh, he's worked hard. I know uh, everybody, there's a lot of people that already have favorite candidates out there. So uh, that's what makes us great as a party to have choice, to have debate, to have elevated conversation. And I believe that's what Governor DeSantis will do when he jumps in. Uh, which is expected to be sometime very soon. It, it seems like there's already a, a, 
and maybe even more of a definition of choice between some conservative policies and liberal policies or what have you. Certainly the policy changes, the laws that have been signed, even while you were in the state legislature. And since then, um, how do you feel about some of those things? Very controversial to some folks. Uh, very, yes, this is what we've always needed for other people in terms of some of those policies. Let me tell you what he's done. Let me, as governor of the state of Florida, you don't say the state of Florida anymore, Ken. I'm in D.C. I mix with people all over the country. They say the free state of Florida. So he's redefined our state for freedom, for for choice, for protecting conservative values. Uh, I was happy to work with him for four years, doing a lot of great things, including a very challenging time with COVID. But he he proved that uh, people want choice in their health decisions. They want choice uh, when it comes to doing what they think is right for their family. And uh, that, that's why he's uh, that's why he's going to make waves and many are going to tune in whenever he makes uh, that decision. So you made a choice leaving the state Senate in Florida to run for Congress now elected. So tell me about this first term, maybe broadly speaking, what have these first six months or so been like in Washington for you? Uh, Kent, thank you. It's been a uh, a learning curve. I am learning. This is my 21st week as being a congressman. Every week we get a little bit better. We're learning uh, new rules, new procedures, how to be effective. We took on the role of servicing our constituents. We said day one, we're going to be the absolute best at taking care of our constituents and customers. We've gotten many opportunities to do that. Uh, that didn't, you know, that didn't change from being a state senator. We take care of the customer or they're going to find somebody else that will take care of the customer. So uh, it's a joy to solve problems. And speaking of problems, our country has some big ones, Kent Justice, big problems that uh, that we're in the middle of the debate from whether it's our border or our debt limit crisis, which is the talk of the town. So it's exciting to be in the mix. Uh, solving problems is in my DNA, and uh, I, I feel like uh, I'm adding value. And I want to. I will be answering to the people of Northeast Florida, and and uh, they'll be judging me. They'll be judging me. They'll be ranking me. But uh, we want to be a congressman they can be proud of. So, Representative Veen, that is one of the big deals we know. So as our visit here, we're ahead of that kind of June 1st deadline on the debt ceiling and this crisis. And we're hearing Janet Yellen talk about, hey, we could be in default as soon as June 1st and that sort of thing. What are the elements that go into solving that issue from your perspective? Kent, it's a simple math equation. We cannot continue to spend more than we take in. We've done it for a very long time, but we have now reached a level of unprecedented debt. We have unprecedented spending, and that's led to unprecedented inflation. So we have to make a decision. What are we going to do as a country to be financially strong? We've always taken for granted that we can always pay our bills, but there we've reached that limit. We've reached that time where we have to make a decision. So uh, the Republican Congress has passed, the Republican House members have passed, limit save grow, where we've we've raised the, dem, the, the debt limit just that much, but it's, it, it, uh, it also comes with some reform in spending. Now, I'm going to tell you two things that are highly controversial, shouldn't be, but uh, you let, uh, let's let the viewers make a decision. One is we rolled back spending levels. Are you ready for this, Kent? to last year, last year. So December, five months ago, that's what the Republicans want to base our spending on. That's COVID is over and we have such uh, unprecedented spending levels, COVID. So the two things that we do, one was we roll back spending just five months ago, but two, here's a sticking point that many find, I've been called an extremist because I want the American people to go to work before they get all these goodies and benefits. And what we ask, is anybody that's between 18 and 55 years old work that can work, that's able-bodied without kids, work 20 hours a week, 20 hours a week before you're eligible for uh, for government programs. I think that's very reasonable. I would probably, if it was up to me, I would want more, but that's where we all agreed is a, uh, is a starting point in that negotiation. But, but by and large, Kent, we have to spend less than we take in. Congress has never, there's never been a Congress that has spent less than the Congress before it. And we have a chance to do that, to set a new tone, a new spending uh, 
direction that's going to bring spending under control, inflation under control, and make the next generation not saddled with the debt, which is where we're headed if we don't make decisions. And so right now on your streaming device, join us on News for Jax Plus, where you can hear Congressman Bean's opinion on border security and changes he wants to see there. All right, mental health, financial well-being, defeating suicide, those are all hot topics for our next guest, the leader of Wounded Warrior Project. Stay with us this week in Jacksonville to hear from Mike Lennington. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. National Nonprofit Wounded Warrior Project is headquartered in Jacksonville. This organization is hyper-focused on veterans' needs, specifically those who served following 9-11. CEO Mike Lennington is with us right now and has become a friend of our show because when we do focus on veteran-related issues, you guys are such a resource. I know you're, you're passionate about helping uh, folks who've served and their families. So let's talk first about Memorial Day. When it comes to you personally, the warriors you serve, what does this weekend mean? What does Monday mean to you? Uh, Memorial Day is a big day. It's, it's, um, it's a big day for us to remember those that have served and sacrificed so much on behalf of all of us. Um, it's a long weekend. Americans across the country will celebrate and have celebrations on Memorial Day weekend, but really for veterans, it's a day of remembering those that have served with them and not come home, yeah. those that made the ultimate sacrifice. So for us, it's a day of remembrance. It's a solemn day. Uh, for warriors in particular, those we serve, it's a, sometimes a difficult time. Uh, many of those they served with are not with us today. So this is a especially poignant day for them to remember their service and to spend time with their families, their units, yeah. and remember their, uh, uh, what, what this day was really meant for. General, I, I appreciate how you, you, so you said poignant and solemn. And, I, and as I formed that question, I thought, well, is, you know, for so many of us, hey, holiday weekend, celebration. Right. There should be, for each of us who are Americans, there should be a moment of reflection or remembrance or, hey, let's pay tribute to those who have given that, that sacrifice, right? Yeah, growing up as a kid, it was about hot dogs, beach parties, beginning of the summer <laughs> and the Indy 500. <laughs> right. Now, across the country for Wounded Warrior Project here in Jacksonville and 25 yeah. other locations and others, um, it's a day of giving veterans the opportunity to give back. Wounded Warriors, the opportunity to give back, go to military uh, cemeteries, uh, meet with Gold Star families. We have a couple projects here in Jacksonville we're doing. We're doing things with some of our veteran service organization partners. It really is a day of service and a day of remembrance. Yeah, it, I, I love the mission of what Wounded Warrior Project does. I've been involved in some of the things that the, the efforts over the years that WWP has done. Uh, I also want to hear about some of the things that your organization is identifying as needs for uh, veterans. Uh, there's financial ones. I've got a graphic here. You, you had listed, your team had sent me, hey, these are some of the top needs, the pressing issues affecting veterans. One of those is mental health and suicide prevention. Uh, another is financial financial wellness, um, increased support for women warriors, that's needed, and, and also uh, dealing with the effects of combat-related toxic exposure. So when you see this list and you see these things, what is Wounded Warrior Project doing to try and maybe meet those needs on your own, but probably try to gather other forces yeah, to about, say, let's do it together, right? It's about collaboration. One of our strategic priorities is collaboration. If we tackle any of those priorities by ourselves, we'll fail. We need, to, we need to collaborate with government, non-government, other nonprofit organizations focused on veterans, community organizations, faith-based organizations, anybody that can help. By the way, you just named our top six priorities for next year. Mental okay. health and enduring priority, always a priority for veterans coming home with the invisible wounds of war. Physical injuries, blast injuries, gunshot wounds, they heal and they're easily identified. But for the invisible wounds, as you've covered with us many yeah, times, right. by the way, thank you. Those wounds sometimes takes years to, to, to expose themselves. And that's the biggest challenge we have right now is redu continuing to reduce stigma and getting veterans uh, help they need so that they prevent you know, yeah. suicide and other disastrous Th outcomes. Th this has been Suicide Awareness Month. It and is. And I know we're to the end it of is. it, but it's certainly something. And, and there's some other groups that are saying, yeah, that's really important to us as well. But it has to be top of mind with the folks that you deal with on a daily basis. It, it is. And then the other one, post-COVID, not surprising, is uh, financial uh, stress. Financial stress among veterans in today's economy is top of mind for us. Our annual warrior survey that we just got back 
showed us that, you know, eight in 10 veterans are having financial difficulty, six in 10 are having difficulty making ends meet at some point over the last six months. Um, we doubled our emergency financial assistance stipends to more than 1,800 families already this year. We're halfway through the year. Those numbers are double what it was last year, and we're bracing for the financial uncertainty that could come in the next six months that I know Americans all across the country are facing. Yep. But you know, if you've been to the gas station or the grocery store lately, your dollar doesn't go as far as it does. So our goal at Wounded Warrior Project is not to just provide financial means, but also help wounded veterans that can find employment, yep. get employment, and we're partnering with tons of organizations nationally here in Jacksonville, CSX and others that are helping provide veteran uh, employment opportunities uh, that they can take advantage of. General, I wanna talk about some more of those priorities and I want you to be able to hear that too. We're out of time for our show, so we wanna offer you more from this interview with General Lennington on News 4 Jax Plus. Just search News 4 Jax on your streaming device to download and then once you're there, you're gonna find this interview under the This Week in Jacksonville channel. So the conversation is gonna continue, just not right here on Channel 4 right now. All right, next time on our show, state CFO Jimmy Patronis talks about the state's economy, insurance, and recovery from hurricanes in 2022. Plus, Mayor-elect Donna Deegan working her schedule to join us soon. Thanks for joining us today. Every day, more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida, and South Georgia's number one source for local news.